there! Welcome to Skate and Key Productions. I'm Crown Grey's Cocon. Let's get into the video. Today's video, we're going to be continuing with our Disney series, and we're going to be looking today at none other than 101 Dalmatians from 1961. So, if you like what you've seen already, don't forget to hit the like button, subscribe if you haven't already, and also don't forget to hit the bell button so you stay notified for upcoming videos. So, as always with our uh, film videos, what we have is that we split into six different parts. So, we have first of all the story of the story, the story of the creator, the story of the studio, the themes in the history, the legacy, and any notable lines or notable effects within the film. So, without further ado, let's buckle up and let's go for the ride. So, in terms of the story of the story, this film from 1961 is actually based off of a book uh, of a similar title from 1956 by uh, Doddy Smith. However, we'll talk about the differences between that version and uh, this version a little bit later. So for now, uh, we're going to dive straight into the plot of 101 Dalmatians. So spoiler alert, if you haven't seen the film already, it came out many years ago, that's your business. Go watch the film and then come watch this video if you're going to be that precious about it, okay? So this is the plot of 101 Dalmatians. So the film starts off with Pongo, the Dalmatian, and he is narrating about the day when he took his pet human, Roger, who's a struggling musician, for a walk to go and find a mate. And in Regent's Park in London, this is where Roger meets Anita and Pongo meets Perdita. Now both couples fall in love, they move into a flat with a nanny, and soon they are expecting puppies. However, Cruella de Vil comes just before the birth, yeah, like a few weeks before, and uh, she is like this crazy lady like who's really into fur and she kind of smells and stuff, right? But Roger makes a song about her, yeah, which is like the theme of the entire film, which is Cruella de Vil. So many weeks later, uh, the puppies are born and there are 15 of them, although it looks initially that one of them didn't quite make it. So Roger does a bit of CPR and he saves that puppy and this one they decide to call Lucky. So just as they're celebrating this, you know, like the puppies are really cute and stuff, but Corella comes in and she uh, offers to buy up the puppies. However, Roger puts his foot down and says no. So she flies into a rage and becomes really, really angry and storms off. So when Roger and Anita go for a walk, a couple of tea leaves take the Mikey Bliss, have half a pinch, and before you know it, the Sweeney are on their Kyber Pass. So that's a bit of um, Cockney rhyming slang, right? Um, so it's in the subtitles now, go go and check out what, what it is that I said, but you can kind of work it out, right? Um, or should at least be able to. So they're all very distraught, and after the pets can't find them, i.e. the humans, the dogs get to work along the so-called twilight uh, gossip chain, right? So this is basically a gossip chain where basically all the dogs at night, like, you know, they all bark and like messages go all around London and like the home counties. So eventually word of this gets to the old colonel and uh, he sends a uh, Sergeant Tibbs, the cat, uh, to go and search the old DeVille mansion. And this is where Sergeant Tibbs finds 99 Dalmatian puppies. So the word gets back to Pongo and Petita and so they go on a mission to rescue them. And in the meantime, Cruella comes and she says that she wants all the puppies to be skinned for their coats. So Tibbs the cat rescues the puppies from the hapless thieves and just as the thieves catch them again, Pongo and Perdita comes in and saves the day. So the family are all reunited and they decide that in spite of the fact that these the other puppies are not theirs, they're going to take them in, right? So all 99, they're going to bring them back home to their pets. And they end up giving the, the thieves a slip again, right? In a very crafty way. And they spend the night resting in a cow pen where weirdly enough, they end up drinking like the cow's milk. So if you know anything about biology, like this doesn't make any sense, but whatever, at least it keeps them out of the cold, right? Um, but anyway, so Cruella and the thieves, they're still on the search for them. So what the dogs decide to do is that as a disguise, they're going to roll in soot and therefore they will no longer look like Dalmatians. They'll look instead like Labradors. So they all sneak onto a van heading to London. But as they're doing this, Cruella ends up spotting them. And this is where you end up having a bit of a car chase. Like, you know, they try to run them off the road. However, the thieves and Cruella end up crashing and they end up just in a ditch somewhere. So now back at the house, the pets are all really worried. Uh, Roger has done really well. That song Cruella de Vil has now made it to, right to the top of the charts. He's now going to be very, very rich. But still, they want their masters back, i.e. they want the dogs back. And this is when all 101 Dalmatians come back. And the film ends happily ever after. And it's just a lovely ending to a lovely film. So, now that we've covered the plot of uh, 101 Dalmatians, now we're going to dive into the creative process that went into uh, creating the actual film. 
So like we said, the uh, film itself is based off of a story uh, from 1956, uh, which was written by Dolly Smith. And uh, in 1957, Walt Disney himself read the book and immediately fell in love with it and sought to obtain the rights for it. We don't know how much he was paid, but you know, it might it might have been quite a lot in those days because like in the early days, Disney didn't pay that much for people, but hopefully by this stage, she got paid a bit more. But it was a thing where Dolly Smith, she wrote the book secretly, she admitted later, uh, with the intention that Disney would eventually end up reading it and make this into one of his films. So what Disney decided, yeah, um, we'll talk about this a little bit later in terms of the budget constraints, but he decided he was going to have one writer for this, right? And this one writer was going to be Bill P. So in many other uh, Disney films, you end up having several writers in, like, I think, Cinderella, there's like up to eight writers. Um, and I don't fully understand why you would do this, because as a script writer myself, it seems maybe for the comedy scenes, it makes sense. But for other things, it's just it's a bit superfluous. But anyway, so Bill P ended up writing the script for this, and it was a thing where when he did the first draft of it, this little bit of trivia, he didn't know how to use a typewriter. So instead, what he actually did is uh, he wrote the entire thing by hand on some legal paper. So just a little bit of trivia with regard to that. And also as well, something to kind of make the point of is that there were many changes from this to the actual original, right? Uh, so what he did was he cut out a lot of the theft that was in there. So for instance, Cruella de Vil, uh, she in the original has a cat. They decided to scrap that. Uh, there was originally going to be uh, two uh, Dalmatian uh, mothers. They decided to shrink that down just into the role of Pedita. The thieves, they were also going to be gypsies. And for once, Disney decided not to target a marginalized uh, racial group. And instead, like they just a uh, regular thief. And in addition to this, they decided that the wedding scene was going to be made much more informal. And the reason for this is because uh, religious groups opposed to the kind of union of like two people in marriage, which is obviously a sacred kind of like institution with the two dogs kind of like uh, getting married. Right. So what they decided to do is kind of make it a bit more informal. So this is the reason why uh, Roger and Anita, they are just dressed in regular clothes rather than kind of like big elaborate like wedding clothes. Right. And. He also made some other minor changes uh, to the names and the gender of different characters, but some of that stuff is a bit too trivial. So we'll, we'll kind of park that for now. If you really, really want to check it out, then go do the research yourself. Um, but that essentially uh, sums up the uh, creative process that went into the making of the film. And you know that Bill Pete did a great job because uh, Doddy Smith, of all people, said that she liked the script, right? Uh, it's very rare for, for, for script writers to adapt a story and for the original person like to, to actually still like it. But it's a thing where she was like, actually, you've improved it. You've neatened up the story um, and yeah, you just made it better in every single way. So that kind of explains the creative process, right? And now we're going to be talking about uh, the story of the studio, right? So all this is all kind of like the, the nitty gritty behind the scenes kind of stuff. So like we said in the last video, which was Sleeping Beauty, Sleeping Beauty was a bit of a slow burner and it really hit the studios really hard, right? So much so that they were kind of like, oh, are we even going to be able to, to function? Are we going to have to make cuts to the, the animation department? And Eric Larson, midway through production, he even said, I don't think we can continue. I think that like, you know, the cost is just getting too much. However, they were able to continue and how they were able to continue was kind of twofold. First of all, um, in terms of like the actual story itself. They looked back at uh, A Lady in the Tramp and saw how much of a box office success that was. So it was like, okay, we're going to pick another dog story because people seem to like dog stories. So let's just do that. It'll be nice and simple. And also as well, in terms of the actual uh, animation. So before this period, uh, Disney would use other techniques. But uh, UB uh, Iwerks, right, who goes all the way back to the old, old days of like Walt Disney's career, right, uh, he had been uh, experimenting with a Xerox uh, photography. And so he ended up modifying a camera um, to, I don't know all the kind of technical things for this, but what it was, was that it would take the uh, drawings by the animators and put them straight onto the actual uh, animation cells. So this would completely cut out the inking process, which was actually quite laborious and quite expensive. And so this ended up cutting down on time and ended up cutting down on money. So much so that it's estimated that the film's budget would have increased by a factor of two if these measures hadn't been put in, right? So really, really good like cost saving stuff. And we have a, a UBI works here to really thank for that. 
in particular because if you think about like how many uh, puppies there are how many dogs there are in general if you think about like all the different spots that would need to be animated it just would have been an absolute headache for them to have done uh, and so basically this process really saved them a lot of time and money uh, also as well in terms of like for the studio like we have with many other disney films you had live action models for this so uh, in terms of the role of Anita, uh, they got uh, Helen Stanley once again. So she had been the model for uh, Cinderella and also for Princess Aurora in Sleeping Beauty. So they used her again. And then in terms of Cruella de Vil, they used Mary Wicks, right? Uh, they also used uh, several other people to kind of like uh, base her character off of. In particular, they also used uh, the uh, voice actress herself with regard to uh, Cruella's cheekbones, right? So the cheekbones that is modeled off of her actual voice actor. So that leads on nicely to the casting of the actual film. So you have Rod Taylor, who is the voice of Pongo, and he also appears in The Time Machine, he also appears in The Birds, and he uh, appears very briefly in Inglorious Bastards. You have uh, Elisa Daniels and Kate Bauer. I don't know why they had two actresses for a Petita's role, but either way, they decided to, to have that. Uh, you had uh, Ben Wright for the role of Roger, and also as well, he is the voice of Rama in A Jungle Book. You have uh, Lisa Davis, uh, who is the voice of Anita, and she is just in very minor roles in other films. Uh, you have uh, Frederick Warlock, who is the voice of Horace the Burglar, and uh, he appears in Spartacus. You have J. Pat O'Malley, uh, who is the voice of Jasper, and he is the voice of Tweedledum and Tweedledee in Alice in Wonderland, as well as uh, he appears briefly in Mary Poppins, and in The Jungle Book, uh, he is the voice of Colonel Harty and one of the vultures. So we covered him in more detail in our uh, Alice in Wonderland video, so definitely uh, go and check that out for a bit more. And then in terms of uh, Martha Wentworth, right, she is the voice of the maid, and her voice was used again in the next film, which is Sword in the Stone, so definitely stay tuned for that when that comes out. Uh, and she is the voice of Madame Mim in that. Two actresses who had been in previous uh, Disney films is uh, uh, Lucille Bliss and Barbara Luddy, and uh, they are the voice of some of the puppies, right? Obviously you have loads of puppies, not all of them have voices and stuff, and many of them are just child actors who weren't in anything else in particular. And then the voice of Cruella de Vil was done by Betty Lou Gearson. So she is in a Cinderella, she's in Mary Poppins, and also she's in uh, the film from the 1990s, which is Cats Don't Dance, which I personally really like as well. So that explains the casting of the actual film. And now we're going to be talking about the uh, themes and the history of it. So first of all, obviously, you have the kind of motive of the struggling artist in Roger, right? So, you know, he's struggling at the beginning of the film and by the end, he ends up making a success of it. And then also as well, you have uh, the themes of like family, you have the themes of community, like everyone uh, in like the whole like London and the home counties is trying to like help these guys and stuff. Uh, and also as well, we see within this film, the first kind of demonstration of the, the new TV generation, right? So in the early 1960s, across the Western world, people were starting to like, have TVs in their homes a lot more. And it was a thing where you can already see from this, the level of like trash TV that these people are absolutely glued to, right? So much so that like the burglars, you know, they won't even do the hit on the actual uh, like puppies until their show's finished, right? So it's kind of like, an early reflection on what the kind of TV was like doing to that generation and like what it's done to subsequent uh, generations. So it's quite interesting to see that. Uh, also as well, you have the kind of very stereotypical like view that Americans had of English people in the 1960s. So you have like stiff upper lip people, you have like you know, very like, kind of, like posh people, you have cockney like working class people. So it's, it's quite an interesting kind of like, look at like English society from like an outside perspective. Uh, and also as well, Disney, like in some other films as well, was really ahead of his time on the, the, the issue of like animal welfare. So we see this with Dumbo, we see this with Bambi. It kind of like plants seeds in like the, the younger generation. And then like as time goes on, people grow up and they always have that little bit inside them that like cares about animals. Whereas in prior generations, people wouldn't really have cared, right? So the anti-fur movement didn't really kick off until the 1980s and the 1990s. But at the time when this film came out, this is when people were just wearing furs, like no one ever thought like, there was any kind of problem with it. But Cruella de Vil's character is the epitome of what's wrong with like the fur trade, that people are willing to go to, to unscrupulous uh, lengths yeah, just to get some furs. And do they really need these furs, etc.? So I think that personally, this film can plant the seed in the anti-fur movement, which would like, kick off about 20 or 30 years later. 
So that explains the kind of like themes and the history of it. And then talk about the uh, legacy of it, right? So like we said, the budget for this was much less than uh, it was for Sleeping Beauty. Sleeping Beauty at the time was the most expensive uh, Disney film that had ever been made. And so because they obviously had to cut down, they decided to have much, much cheaper. So the final budget for this was actually 3.6 million, right? However, in the US and Canada alone, it made $14 million. And worldwide, it ended up having a huge uh, audience, right? It was actually the number one film in France in 1961. And if you know anything about like the French film industry, especially in those days, it was very uh, protectionist, right? So for an American film to break through in, into like a French audience shows just how like that like, kind of like uh, popular it was. And then also as well, in terms of the lifetime growth that it had, it was $303 million. And when you adjust that for inflation, that equals $900.3 million. So it was absolutely raw and successful a film, and it gave Disney the budget to make many other great films in the 1960s. So that kind of covers the uh, legacy of it, and also as well, actually, I forgot to say, uh, they also made uh, like kind of, uh, some live action uh, 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 versions of like the film in like, the, uh, the 1990s and the 2000s. They had a TV show. And also in 2021, they've had uh, Cruella. So I still haven't gone and watched that. I know that Emma Stone is a really good actress. So I'll definitely try and like kind of like go and, and watch that at some point and uh, give my thoughts on that. I heard it got mixed reviews when it came out like kind of in the box office. But at the same time, she's good. So it probably is a great film. Now talking about the uh, notable lines and notable effects. Like we said, because of everything was kind of really stripped back, there aren't really any notable effects, really. If you look at the uh, animation, it's quite basic, it's quite plain. Uh, there aren't any kind of like great shots that you have in some other Disney films that almost look like very cinematic. It's just a very plain film. And also as well, uh, they use many of the same scenes from London uh, that they have uh, from uh, Peter Pan. And also, they literally have the same dogs in uh, Lady and the Tramp and one of the scenes in this, right? So a lot of like recycling, a lot of kind of cutting the corners with regard to this. So it still is a great film, uh, even though the musical numbers, there's only two of them, right? There's Cruella de Vil, and then at the very, very end, they have like Dalmatian Plantation, which is just a terrible song, whatever you like. But anyway, so really it's, the, the, it's just Cruella de Vil, uh, like kind of, and it, in terms of like notable lines, you have this. <laughs> And you have this. And you have this. I like to do is kiss it out. Why, Patch, where did you ever hear such talk? Certainly not from your mother. And you have this. There they go, Horace Millad. Out for their evening constitutional. One more pinch and they'll throw the keys away. Oh, come off it, Horace. We're getting plenty of boodle. And you have this. Spotted puddings, poodles. No, no, puddles. Fifteen spotted puddles. Oh, bother dash. And you have this. I don't care how you kill the little beast, but do it! Oh, please, miss, now have pity, will you? Can't we see the rest of the show first? So, in total, I think that 101 Dalmatians is a really, really enjoyable film. Uh, I think that, like, you know, if you remember what I said about um, uh, uh, Lady and the Tramp, for that film there, it's a lot more of a kind of dog-centric kind of, like, film. And so if you're a real, like, dog lover, it's, like, a really great film. But if you're not, then it's a bit like, I don't really care. Uh, whereas this, there's the really good balance yeah, between the, the actual uh, uh, animals and also like the uh, people themselves. So I think it's a great film. The whole family can watch it. The whole family can enjoy it. And if you haven't seen it already, I don't know what you've been doing, right? But obviously, if you like this video, don't forget to hit the like button. Subscribe if you haven't already. Hit the bell button so you stay notified. And also stay tuned for our next video, which is going to be on uh, The Sword in the Stone from 1963. So definitely check that out. And also stay tuned for all of our other videos, which are going to be looking at all the Disney films, all the Kubrick films, all the Chaplin films, all the Spielberg films, etc. etc. This channel is not going anywhere. So spread the word, spread the love. And in the meantime, have a great day and bye.